All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to another long-awaited episode of the Freetography Podcast. Today, we're looking at episode number 13. Today, guys, we have a very big, very special episode all about the Peter Grant Mansion. If you don't know, the Peter Grant Mansion is pretty much considered the largest abandoned mansion in all of Canada. And at this point, it's probably the one of the most popular and most well-known abandoned places in all of Canada. This place has been covered in the news by news outlets across Canada and all over the world. I made my first visit in May of 2000 during COVID. Then I went back again one year later. So about a year after my second visit in March of 2022, I got an email from a guy named Chris Fisher, who was a developer and an investor from Texas. He sent me an email to tell me that he has entered into an agreement to buy the Peter Grant mansion. And his plan is to completely finish the job, renovate, restore this building, this mansion into something to be completely usable and accessible to the general public. We had a very long phone call. He told me all of his plans, got some of my insights on the place. So we decided to keep in touch throughout this process, which we have done. So a couple of weeks ago, the CBC ran an article talking about the Peter Grant Mansion and how Chris has purchased it and that they have plans to run a reality TV show on the building and the restoration of this project. So it turns out that Chris has hired a production company and they are now shopping the idea around to TV networks and streaming services to see who might be interested in picking up a reality TV show, potentially five to six seasons to document the entire process of cleaning up, rebuilding and completing this project of the Peter Grant Mansion. The show will be called Mansion Impossible and it will star Chris Fisher and his family, as well as all kinds of different contractors and construction workers to help finish the job. So naturally, what did I do? Sent an email to my friend Chris and asked him if he would be interested in speaking with us on the Freakography podcast about this project and this exciting concept of a reality TV show around rebuilding and completing the project of the Peter Grant Mansion. And of course, Chris was happy to talk to me. So before we get to the conversation with Chris, let's go back to my first video from 2020. And we're going to run my narration and some of the video footage to bring you guys up to speed on what exactly the Peter Grant Mansion is, what its history is, and what we know. Then we're going to get to the conversation with Chris. So here we go, guys. Episode 13 of the Photography Podcast, all about the Peter Grant Mansion. Let's go. This home was built by a man named Peter Grant the head of Grant Forest Products, a Canadian forest industry company that at its peak employed nearly 600 people in Ontario alone and 715 people across Canada. Grant Forest Products operated six mills, two in Ontario, one in Alberta, and two in South Carolina, and was North America's third largest maker of oriented strand board a product similar to plywood that is used to build walls, floors, and roofs. Peter Grant was listed as the 87th richest person in Canada in the early 2000s. This massive success prompted him to build this castle in Northern Ontario. In 2005, Peter started work on the mansion, which was to be used as an office complex, living quarters, and a showcase for Grant products. Located in Northern Ontario, about 140 kilometers north of North Bay, the 65,000 square foot house would sit on the shores of a popular lake. In 2005, Peter Grant started work on this mansion, which was supposed to be used as an office complex, living quarters, and a showcase for Grant products. However, a strong downturn in the global economy in 2007 hit Grant Forest products hard. Peter Grant was forced to abandon construction of the mansion in 2008. As of 2020, it is not clear who exactly owns this property. However, news articles from June 2018 state that it is owned by a Toronto area company who also owns another vacant property in the same town. All right, guys, here we go. Very special episode. We got Mr. Chris Fisher all the way from the state of Texas in the United States. Chris Fisher is the gentleman who has purchased the Grant Mansion. And uh, big news this last week on the CBC about the uh, concept of Mansion Impossible and the idea that Chris has to uh, basically 
rebuild the Grant Mansion. We're going to hear all about it. Thanks a lot, Chris, for joining us today. Hey, my pleasure. Appreciate you making time. Great. So, so much interest in this story. And I put out a call to my my people who follow me and I asked them to submit some questions for me. But let's let's start a little bit and just tell us about who's Chris Fisher. What uh, what do you do and how did you how did you get to this point? Oh, hey, I'm, the truth of this story is I'm, I'm a developer here in Texas. I own restaurants, et cetera. But the truth of the mansion is I was just bored one night, really. And I, and I look at YouTube and I believe I saw your video is, you know, these different guys sneaking in these mansions. And and the, the one that popped up said million dollar mansion you can buy for a dollar, but nobody wants. <laughs> and, <laughs> right the whole, and I sat there all night. And when I came upon this one, I watched it over and over. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I just kept watching them. I watched any film I could get my hands on on this thing. But uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's really not like we were seeking this. This is a project that just kind of came upon us and, and just my curiosity and my background as a builder, this this structure just just caught my attention. And I said, I couldn't get off it. Wow. So, so yeah, so you contacted me back in March of 2022 and you told me that you were in an agreement to purchase the place and had entered into a deal and you already had the idea at that point of doing some kind of a reality show with it. Now, so my question is, you saw it on video, you entered into a deal to buy it, but when you saw it in person, did you think you might have bit off more than you could chew? I'll be honest, you guys you guys filmed the bad stuff <laughs> when you went in there. <laughs> I, was, I was actually kind of relieved a little bit. Uh, you know, you've been there and you see all that water leakage on film. And I'm thinking, my yeah. goodness, this roof's done. And when I got there, yeah. I saw, well, it's just the, the pipes had fallen off the drain pipes. So it was a relief. But what impressed me was more the size of it because you can't capture the size on the film. I mean, you guys are sitting there in oh, yeah. the picture where they zoom out with you on the deck. And where you're standing on that deck till you look over the edge and realize you're about 60 feet up in the air, it's it's just massive. And until you're in person, you, you can't realize. And that's what I think got me most was the in person, just the sheer size of the structure. Have you talked at all to the former owner, uh, Peter Grant? I have not talked to Peter. Um, no. We have been working trying to get with him. Peter's getting up there in years. Um, yeah. So we've kind of talked with a lot of people involved in the project. I talked with Peter's son. And I would love to get to the point where we can get, I think a lot is going to be trust because we're taking over one of his projects, his baby. And so yeah. it's a kind of a delicate situation because we want to honor kind of what he was trying to do in his vision and move it mm -hmm. forward. So we, we, we think we'll get to that point. Um, I think is what they want to see from us is with the show and everything like that, that it's not a ripping on somebody. It's, it's a, Fun show, educational show. So I think I think we'll get to that point. But I would love to meet him because I've done so much research mm -hmm. on this guy, and yeah. it just blows my mind some of the things he did because he was. I, I see a lot of what I do in what he does. You know, he sounds right. like ADD just all over the place. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I I looked everywhere to see if I could find some sort of schematics or blueprints or anything to show me his vision for the finished version of the inside of this place. And if I really hope you can somehow get your hands on that, because that would be amazing to see what he had visioned. Right. Here's, here's what I learned today. I actually got two days ago when the story broke, we got other people calling us who used to work on the mansion. And today I spoke for okay. an hour and a half with the gentleman who was the a landscape architect. And you hear things about fire breathing dragon and all these things. And he's telling me about this stuff. And he's told yeah. me when you ask for blueprints, what makes it hard is he said, he said he lives in Sudbury and he said, Chris, we go up for biweekly meetings with the Grant family, Peter Grant. And he said, yeah. by the time I got home, the plans changed. He said it was literally, oh we would leave the meeting with, okay, we're going to do this. And by then Peter would change everything. He said, all of his drawings are just continuous changing because I've seen a lot of, you know, pictures, artists, artists renditions. And they're all there. Yeah. So it really makes this going to be a tough project. It's, it's a big puzzle. I mean, really, yeah. um, I don't know if you know this, but it really was just a boathouse to start with. So there wasn't a, okay. a project. So we started with a boathouse. It was simply a boathouse. Then they added the living quarters. And I was talking to an engineer, and it's funny. He said, one day Peter came out and said, well, I want to put my corporate headquarters here too. And the engineer said, you can't just do that. You just can't add something. And he said, you'll figure it out. And he walked off. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Now you've, um, we're going to, I got uh, so many questions to ask you, but I, what I'm really curious about is the reception of the people in Haleybury, Ontario. What do they think of all this? It's a mixed bag. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And we, we've, I've been up there now probably about five or six times and yeah. met with a lot of people involved. Um, you got some of those people who are always going to be the negative ones. And we started posting when people are breaking in the mansion, we got cameras now. So we post some of their pictures. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> there's some lady who always chimes in every single time with something negative. And I kind of responded to her privately. I said, you know, you're that person who – like on Christmas morning, when Santa brings all the gifts and everything, you would come down and complain because he spilled some cookie crumbs from the cookie you left. You know, they find <laughs> the negative in everything. And But other, yeah, yeah. The other people have been funny. Um, we interviewed some local people. And the, the funniest one, there's a kid, maybe seventh grade. And he was with his buddies down at the skate park. And we were interviewing. They didn't know who we were or whatever. It was just kind of a blind mm-hmm. interview. And this little yeah. kid's. He had the, the the brain of somebody 50 years old. He's talking about all oh, the value of the land, the values in the land. You know, he said the man just got to work on it. He's going to he's doing like a financial analysis. Of this. Oh, that's amazing. And then he's talking about him and his buddies go there all the time. It was funny. His three of his buddies are standing next to him. And are like, dude, shut up. We don't even know what they want. <laughs> you know, like, we're, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so that was pretty cool uh, on there. But, yeah, the, the people, um, it's kind of a mixed bag. I think, you know, some people say, oh, it's ugly, tear it down. And, um, you know, but. People don't realize you've been in there. I've been in there. They don't realize how this thing was built. You just don't tear that thing down overnight. Yeah. Uh, it's a monster. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, so we're excited to bring the, you know, our Texas culture up there. But somebody actually told me, they said, you'll be surprised. I see it, too. He said the northern people in northern Ontario will probably be more like you people in Texas than you think. So you'll probably have a lot. Right. In common. And I kind of see that versus you down at Toronto, uh, yeah. know, different people. So, yeah, so I think it's going to be fun. And that. Part of this whole show we want to do is it's not just watching us hang drywall all day long. It's, it's us interacting with the community, doing uh, promoting the area. Um, right. So I know you, this this property has 43 acres and the mansion just sits on the front corner. So we're going to develop right. the whole 43. So we're interested in the culture and, and what do we do for this community? So. Um, so, yeah, so it's a lot of uh, different things that we're going to try to do there. But uh, the people themselves, everybody who's talked to us has been pretty cool and what I find really Good. is everybody, it seems, in that town has a connection to Peter Grant. This guy, <laughs> everywhere, you know, they either worked for him, their dad worked for him, or somehow he impacted them. And usually it's financially. He impacted them in a positive way through the stuff he does. Cool. So do you see um, – I mean how, how much – how am I going to word this question? I mean I've seen that it's, that what I – I don't know anything about building <laughs> or construction or development. Now when I, went, when I go in there, the second time I was there – I was blown away at the damage that has been caused. Now, maybe most of it is just surface level stuff. How is the structure? Is it actually still pretty sound? And structurally, this is what people are surprised in. And when you engineer a building, there's usually a time frame the engineer for. This building's meant to last X amount of time. The engineering right. on this is 300 years. Okay, so okay. that's pretty impressive. And yeah. people talk about just destroying it. I said, those walls, most of them are 18 inch thick concrete. And what mm-hmm. we had kind of privilege doing is I've been able to see time lapse pictures as they were building from the ground up in the boathouse when it was just nothing but a hole in the ground and worked great through. And I saw a forklift driving on the roof uh, of this thing. I mean, <laughs> you know that, that, that up top part, and they had a lift forklift. Yeah, there. yeah. That's you know everything is just concrete and steel, and it's just, yeah. uh, you know so that. But the stuff in the surface, the stuff you saw, you know the wood, um, yeah, you know that's going to be torn out, and so. Really, us going in there this first season is just removing stuff, whether it be mechanical um, surface material, and find out where we're at. You know, because they yeah. when they were done, stopped construction. Was say they said I think it was like seventy five percent complete. So we're gonna probably go mm-hmm. backwards when we're done by the end of summer. Maybe we're only at the fifty percent mark because we tore out a bunch of stuff. Um, so yeah, but a lot of the stuff, you know, we don't know what it is as far as um, this goes back to that puzzle we talked about. What were they even thinking? What were they trying to do? Because yeah. it's not normal stuff. You know? <laughs> it really is. Yeah, yeah. Cutting edge technology in 2005, but it's not right. Before, you know, and uh, simple things. Yeah. They didn't have LED lighting back then. You know, now we got all that mm-hmm. at home. So, what would have took you know to light that place up? You know, the amount of power just with all the lights they have in there. We could probably do that today on one fuse <laughs> with LED light. Yeah. You know? <laughs> a lot of change. So a lot of stuff will take out just because it's no longer even relevant. All right. So so let's get to the big question that everybody wants to know then. What's the plan with the property? What is it going to be residential? Is it going to be mixed use? What are you thinking? What we can say is it will not be somebody's home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, I said the more research I've done, it was never 
Peter Grant was never going to live there. It was never a mansion. So I think it's kind of been mislabeled a little bit. Um, you know, mm-hmm. corporate headquarters, a museum, swimming pools. Um, we can't really say what we're going to do with it. And that's going to be okay. our question. That's going to be part of the show. But the Good. goal is what we do is it's got to be economically viable. It's got to be able to sustain itself. And that's going to be a task. Um, but I told you how these people reach out to us. We had a company who deals with green, making things green, you know, whether it be energy efficiency for housing. Yeah. And, stuff. and they wanted to work with us about making this the largest, greenest, you know, structure, you know, around. So it'd be kind of cool right. uh, partnership. But yeah, as far as what we're going to do, there's there's options we've, we've looked at. Um, but somebody's got to be able to run this thing when it's done. You know, you can't have utility bills that are, you know, 100,000 plus a month. You can't, you know, these, these extremes. Yeah. And when Peter built it, you got to remember, I mean, Times were good. <laughs> he was, yeah. I think he, they said he was netting a million dollars a day at the factories. And so it really, right. worrying about your electric bill was not on the forefront. <laughs> and I talked, <laughs> to he, said yeah. too. he said, there wasn't about energy efficiency. So when we rebuild this thing, that's got to be part of it. How do we, you know, make this thing, uh, you know, reasonable. But as far as the use, there's just, it, you know, we really got to, and then the big goal too, I guess, when you talk about use is, I know in order for that to help the community, you got to do something that brings money from the outside. Um, and I yeah. say that by if me and you are in the same town and we I have a cow who has milk and uh, you have a cow and you make butter and we just keep switching products and paying each other. None of us mm-hmm. better off than the day before. So right. if we bring money from the outside, you know, the big cities coming up here and doing stuff. I know that scares people sometimes. Oh, we don't want people coming to our community. <laughs> well, they bring money with them. OK, <laughs> they don't. Come yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah. is a big thing. And I'm talking not just Canada. I mean, what you guys they have up there. Um it's kind of those things when you, you live somewhere, you take for granted what you have. Like here in Texas, mm-hmm. we have these wild hogs. They're a pest here. But people up north love to come down and go hunting wild boars and stuff. And to me, <laughs> my dude. <laughs> and so it's kind of first up there, what you guys have in that communities uh, of, you know, to Michigan Shores, the hunting, the fishing, the the guys down here would get blown away by ice fishing. I mean, they would go there just for the experience of Sitting in a shack, right. I don't understand. Y'all gonna have to get me out there and explain that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, but they would love that stuff. And so when we talk about what we can do, is how we bring outsiders. It's something. It's going to be something along those lines. Can we get people in Dallas interested in coming up to this thing uh, and doing, mm-hmm. bringing outside money? Is a big goal that will help the community in the long run because it's new money. So now, so you clearly uh, have the have the means to have initiated this whole process have you brought on uh some any sponsors uh with the show or the concept to help you to subsidize all of this so we the thing with the show is we will be able to and we're starting to see that Mm -hmm. come in where people when you get exposure and they know what's going to happen i talked about the green energy company uh yeah there's small people for example uh, all that graffiti there's a gentleman out of minnesota who makes a product called elephant snot it takes off okay. graffiti and so to bring those people up and and part of the show is show these things you know how does it take that graffiti you've been in there that thing is yeah. plastered and it's not plastered yeah <laughs> it's a glass the windows the rocks it's all done so it's so that's a big thing um there's another company with the cameras Vosker's made uh they're in canada spy point and Vosker makes the cameras that we use and so yeah. they will sponsor us and you know they provide the cameras for this thing and it's cool because you know, now I can see if you sneak on there, I can see you this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so we will see that. But I think as we get into this, uh, we will see a lot of that jumping on and we can offer people say, OK, hey, here's what we're going to do. And and I'm hoping, you know, you're talking the glass. Hopefully we can find a glass company because everyone. Yeah. Can come out of that thing and then be replaced. Every, yeah. I couldn't believe the. The first time I went, there was a lot of windows intact, and that glass is thick. Yeah. And then I came back the second time, and that so much of it was shattered. It's got to take some serious power to blow down those windows. <laughs> yeah, and it's the glass is we found it outside. I'm sure if you walked around, it's four inches thick. There's four panes yeah. of glass, and you got liners in between, and they're considered they call them bulletproof, but it's like hurricane glass yeah. down here in the in the south where you have hurricanes coming in. Um, but yeah, I think when you tell somebody something's bulletproof, you. They're going to test it, <laughs> you know, and I think that and they did. <laughs> they're, they're going to see if it was or not. So, I mean, because you see a lot of them where it's, you know, it's shattered on the outside panel, but the inside's smooth. It's not, but you know, it's mm-hmm. toast. I mean, you can't use it. But uh, yeah, the one yeah. is massive. And uh, what we kind of find out with this mansion is, I do research on these things, and the glass was made by a company called Bernstein's Glass. I think St. Bernstein's, I believe, and it's okay. the world's clearest glass. And okay. kind of 
exemplifies what that mansion was about. Everything at the time was the best of the best that he put in there. Yeah. And yet I'm sitting here, I'm looking at my window now, and I've never thought to myself, gee, I wish my glass was clear. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> so things like that, that will, you know, just kind of blow me away with this mansion when we start doing the research, what the materials were. Because, you know, as you walked around, you saw there was uh, invoices up all over the floor, you know, all that stuff's yeah. in there still. So you're picking it up, you know, invoice $60,000 for this. And, and it just yeah. boggles my mind. So we started finding some of these people. And then with the reach out, when uh, we started telling people we're going to do this, the, the network of guys getting the word out, I've got people calling the company who did the rocks out front, you know, calling, mm-hmm. hey, they want to be part of this product. People want to be part of finishing this thing up. I think a lot of guys That's put amazing. time and effort into this and they want to see it done. You know, I mean, I'm thinking yeah. – if I was the architect, I would think that would be a structure that's, you know, behind my desk, a little uh, model of it sitting there, you know, and some yeah. cool people. And uh, yeah. so, so it'd be interesting. But I know he hasn't, the architect hasn't been back there since I think 2008. Oh, wow. They, I took a, another gentleman who was the main, one of the main builders. Uh, last time I was up there, we went in together and he was practically not in tears, but you could feel the emotion. Yeah. And he's mm-hmm. saying, you know, these are our people did this. He said, I can't believe this. So yeah. He was just blown away. Uh, by the damage. Yeah. One of the things that uh, really struck me when I was in there was the craftsmanship and, you know, the brick work and just looking around that some guy spent a whole goddamn day <laughs> building this wall. And then he went home to his wife and his family. And for what? You know, it's heartbreaking to think how many people busted their asses on that place. And this is, I, I'm not going to, you know, uh, speak ill of Mr. Grant because what happened happened. And, yeah. but it breaks my heart for these guys that put so much work into it. So it actually, it's great to hear that you're hearing back from so many of them that want to see it through. Yeah. I think it was, you know, the people we talked to is, I think Peter went back and took care of the locals and that whole building was local people. I mean, his, his mm-hmm. and this is what, what blows me away about Mr. Grant was he could have, he could have took his money and gone to New York. He could have gone to LA and built a beautiful, you know, in a nice weather. And he didn't, he yeah. did it in that community. And that says a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think his roots were there. He's, he's still there. You know, he owns a yeah. whole course of stuff. He's there. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I talk, we hear about the uh, philanthropy things he did. They, there's something called the frog's breath. I think uh, a big yeah. golf tournament with, with millions of hospitals and stuff up there. Yeah. And so, I mean, he gives back and that's why sometimes, you know, I read some of these, uh, People make comments and stuff. Oh, it's just a rich guy or something, something. I said, but he he was a philanthropist and he gave to that community and those people. Yeah. And and that's to be commended. You know, I mean, I'm thinking I'm not a big fan of the cold. I would have been I'm out. <laughs> that being said, we are strictly a summer operation. When the when the lake breaks, no yeah. <laughs> it freezes, we're gone. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's a, so here's a few questions. Some are from me and some are from uh, the people that have put in a question. First question is from me. Uh, you've already sort of alluded to this, but what are you doing right now to keep me out <laughs> or people like me? <laughs> we dug a bunch of holes and we covered it with wire mesh and leaves <laughs> and we put <laughs> wild tigers in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, we really right now it is, you know, we secured it up as best you can. And the, the thing that, you know, I think some of you guys who do what you do, you don't go in there and wreck stuff. And I think 99% no. of people probably that way. It's the 1%. You can see them. You know, they're nice. All six guys with hoodies at 1230 in the morning. Gee, I wonder what they're doing. <laughs> you know? And, yeah. You know, yeah. Like that. So we can see them on camera. So right now, really, to be honest, all we can do is shame them publicly on Facebook. The, um, like you said, I think one of your things, I think it's a $65 ticket, you know, big deal. Yeah. So until we get yeah. there and once we get there next mm-hmm. summer, we'll – one of the first goals is we will make some kind of a structure so somebody can stay there year round because we can't go up there and clean it up and then just get smashed in the winter. Um, so that's yeah. a big, big priority uh, to do something like that. But you know, we try to make it harder, but a lot of people just don't care. Um, right. Really. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it is frustrating. You see, because most people are there to just, like I said, to, to view the massive structure. And it's just, yeah. there's some people that there's just no reason for what they do. And an example is, you know, downstairs in the pool, there was all those um, boilers. There's like 18 of yeah. a row. And I had gone up in the spring and they were all just fine. Nobody messed with them. And the next time I go back, every single one of them would just smash in. Didn't steal them. They just smashed the covers. And I'm like, why? You know, what What thrill do you get out of that? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Maybe the break in the glass. That's that's a little more exciting. <laughs> you're smashing something. So uh, so stuff like that. So, yeah, the security wise, it's it's more let's get through this winter. 
Um, you know, we can see people going up there. I can call the police and they'll go down and get somebody off. Um, it is right. funny though, because I was there, um, well, I've been there several times. I don't know if you remember this, you know, the lighthouse up top or all that, that final room at top was all the glass all the way around. Yeah. I slept up there. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah I'm going to tell you, you're not the only one I get. <laughs> so <laughs> we had gone up. If you remember, you go up the stairwell and then there's, it, it was always open, but there's a door because they had scaffolding over that stairwell to get to the roof. But there was yes. a chat opening where you could get into the room. And uh, yeah. so I bring somebody up there to show them and that door was closed. And I'm thinking, this is odd. And I'm trying to push on it. It won't open up. And I said, oh, uh-huh. and that was in the morning. I said, we'll just come back later. Let's get some fry bars or something because it was hammered like shut. You couldn't get it open. Okay. And so we go back late in the afternoon with pry bars. And I start yanking on it and trying to bust these, what I think are nails. And uh, the guy with me says, I'll go downstairs and get a bigger pry bar. And I say, okay. So he kind of goes around the corner. But then I hear a voice says, can we talk? And I'm like, Dave? <laughs> I'm looking down because people are there with the voice says, from love. And literally, well, the guy has been living there for about a month and a half in that top tower. When we got in there, he had he had like a stove area. He had an art gallery going on. He had his tent. Up. It was like his living thing. And he'd been there for a month. Wow. And uh, so anyhow, the cops are saying, why are you here? And he said, I saw the films. <laughs> he said that it was a band. <laughs> and so he said, well, he said it was a band. He didn't say it was an open house. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we, so we got him up there. That was funny. But, yeah, I couldn't believe how he just made it his home. And you've been in there, I think, during the day. I don't know if you've ever been there at night. But both. Yeah, both, it's both. scary during the day. And I'm thinking, I, yep. I ain't sleeping up there at night. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have to the for sleeping there because the noises and stuff in that building are just amplified. And I know as they're going yep. to day once, I'm just walking around and I, I knew I heard a voice because somebody was in the building somewhere. But you can't tell it's so big, you can't tell where it come from. Yeah. You slowly yeah. walk along and all of a sudden them pigeons will fly by you or something. And you just about drop your drawers. Right yeah. There. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I had put, uh, I had the, the first time I went, I slept in my car out in the parking lot. Uh, the second time I went, I slept up in that room and I had closed that door and I put some empty beer cans on top of it Here's just in case some crazy crackhead came in at three in the morning. But yeah, the noises that you hear from the, the wildlife that comes in and out, I didn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Our cameras every night say at nine o'clock, there's a big fat raccoon that goes in the door. <laughs> I see it. It's like <laughs> same, same raccoon going in the front door there. <laughs> like, OK. Uh, so. All right. So you've uh, you've answered a lot of the questions that people have, are, have asked. But um, I mean, I've had people say, would you be willing to open it up to allow explorers one last chance to see it before work begins? <laughs> Well, one of my daughters is going to be doing tours, so you have to pay for it. <laughs> she, okay, she, smart, very smart. They're going to do – because I think people want to see it, and then I kind of told the producer, I said, we want people to see what we're doing. Number one, we want to see what we're doing. We want them to know where we are. We want to yep. Miss yep. to be known by everybody because it's twofold. This is a business. I got land we're developing there, and totally. I want people to know yeah. about it. Um, but, yeah, so my one daughter's got it lined up where she's going to do tours at lunch every day. <laughs> <laughs> and That's cool. Twelve wow. bucks and sell them a T-shirt to say, "Yo, hey, man." <laughs> Yo. <laughs> so. One question. Now, you're, I know you're being vague about your plans. Yeah. So, um, do you have a type of design style in how you plan to renovate? The thing with the mansion, and like I said, you've been there. Is you you can't change a lot of what's there. So we've got to find something yeah. design within that structure. You're, you're not moving a wall ten feet to the left. Um, it's mm-hmm. not going to happen. So you really got to design something that's there. And that's why a lot of people say certain things like, uh, say for example, a hotel, it's not designed. Mm-hmm. There's no layout or they said a casino. I said, it just doesn't fit. You know, if you're going to do a casino, you build it down on the bluff somewhere and build it specifically for that use. You can't try to convert right. it. So, so it's going to be unique. I mean, that's one of the challenges is how do you design it within the design that's already there? Um, so we, right. I think I got it. It's, it's in my head. <laughs> so <laughs> see if we can put it on paper. And uh, I think that's I think why this product is good for me, to be honest, is it in when I do stuff is I see I can see things in my head. And a lot of people can't. When they look at that, man, right. they watch y'all's videos and they see that people are like, no way. They're, they're running away. And for me, I don't mm-hmm. pass at all. I can see a finished product. I can see it uh, in my head. I think that takes a, a special it's not a special person, but a vision, you know, that I think a lot of people can't do. And it's not just a big structure like that. I mean, you could take a simple house and some people can go in there and envision their, all their furniture and everything there. And other people have, they can't right, do nothing. Right. So. Do you have an estimated o- overall cost that you think this will be? 
uh, if you're will, if you're comfortable with giving that, or do you have a do you have an estimate of what you sure. think this is going to run? Uh, it's one of those things that's that's kind of one of the big unknowns going into this. Um, yeah. You know, we know at the time they stopped construction, they put close to seventy-two million dollars Canadian uh, into yeah. that project. But that's you know dirt work and everything. Um, but the thing is, they've done the structural. We we really won't do any structural changes. Uh, so it's right. really going in, gutting and mechanic, you know, replacing mechanical stuff. Um, so uh, you kind of referenced earlier about sponsors. So you're going to say, okay, our budget is X, but hopefully yeah. you get a certain amount of sponsors that you just keep going down with what your, your costs are. Uh, and it'll right. be different. You know, I'm not going to lie to you is that, you know, Peter Grant, when he did it, had unlimited funds. You know, he could buy <laughs> glass from Egypt and the floor from Pakistan. Yeah. So yeah. one of our things is how do you go in and do something that gives the same look, but maybe you're using a different material that's more reasonable. Um, mm-hmm. I, I kind of laugh at the stone that's on the building. It's called Arizona stone down here. Everybody's got that, <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's a pretty unique product, <laughs> but up there is, you know, it's unique. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, products are digging. And, and I know that wood work in there. I think it's some brown wood from Africa or something, some kind of thing. And I said, I could probably mm-hmm. the same look by using a staining technique and pine. <laughs> you know? Right. And right. Yeah. Most people, me, you, and 99% of the world would never know the difference. And, uh, it's right, big right. Thing. and you know, I look at the marble on the floor. I mean, it's, it's great. It's from Pakistan, but I said, I can get the same thing out of South Dakota, you know, for yeah. pennies that they you know paid on something like that. Yeah, so. you've already touched on this, and this is a great question. But will you be making sustainability-based upgrades, such as heat pumps, solar panels? That uh, you already touched upon the whole green element of that, but uh, does that go even farther? I don't know how far we'll go on the commercial because it's, it's it's commercial structure. I mean, it's that big. Yeah. So you're gonna try to yeah. do what you can do, um, you know, because it's not. You know, when people do buildings of it, it's not, they sometimes think that everybody wants to cheat and get away cheap. But in the long run, that doesn't help because if you put in, say, let's just say a heating system, they have different right. sear levels. If you put in the, you know, the old 11 sear, you're going to be painting at the gas pump, you know, versus something mm-hmm. more efficient. So you want to be efficient. Um, foaming. Uh, we build houses down here and we use spray foam, closed cell foam, which is not typical in the southern areas like this um, yeah. because it's just down here. People don't equate insulation with keeping the air conditioning and they think it always is heat uh so stuff like right. that um but yeah i think the goal is the best you can but there's a there's also a point of diminishing return you know where where you gotta find that level you know what point is it not yeah. worth putting money because you're not getting anything back how long do you think this is going to take uh, i mean obviously you probably have it uh, planned in sort of stages yeah we're we're thinking <laughs> there's going to be so many surprises in this thing to be honest I'm, i mean it's just every time you go in there you're gonna you're gonna find stuff and you don't know what it is um, yeah, but we're looking at, we liked, you know, we're talking to the different, uh, production companies that we're working with and say, look, we think we could do five seasons. Um, not mm-hmm. necessarily you know, your final reveal would be the fifth season. Um, it's funny because it's not being that you're doing a film, it's not a construction schedule because now your, your schedule is based on, um, episodes and seasons, <laughs> you know, type stuff. Yeah, right, it's right. a different thing. And, but we're probably thinking four or five years, but you know, year two will be pretty big impact. You'll have, you know, totally enclosed. And even this, this first year, the goal is to take it from an abandoned structure to a structure under construction. So everything's cleaned up, the property's cleaned up, the, the building's clean. And if you walk through, it doesn't look like, you know, a bomb went off in there or something. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm just saying there's going to be a lot of things we don't know. But working just in the summers will be kind of cool because you, you work the summers, but then you spend the winters prepping for the next year, getting material right. on the site. And you know, develop your plans and, and getting it done. Um, so yeah, so it'll four to five years at least. I mean, I mean, it took them what two thousand five, eight, nine, probably three and a half years full time with big, yeah, groups there, yeah. You know, big monster guys doing it. Right, and now, so you're working with a production company now, or you've got a producer? So we work with um, a company. So we're, we got two producers, uh, but we signed a contract with a company out of. Um, LA called River Rock Films, and they have a new division for reality shows called River Rock Real, and they'll okay. be the production company on this, and it's their job is to find where a network places this. Um, so it's kind of cool that they have all the ability to do mm-hmm. film cuts and clips and, and all that stuff. So they'll, they're, they're our partner on this thing, um, and they're excited because they just this will be their first reality um, venture into it. They do films and stuff. But this is their right, vision. Right. And it's funny because the guy who they hired from another company coming to do this, this kind of landed on his plate. And this is kind of their priority. They're like, this just doesn't happen. Something like this just doesn't show up. 
and uh, so they're right. excited about it. So yeah, so I mean, it's it's their job to do the film side, you know, get it placed somewhere. And it's not just there's not just limited markets to the American the U.S. I mean, this thing can go anybody oh. can do it. And yeah. I know, for example, I like I, Gold Rush, and Gold Rush is produced by a company out of England. You know, have you seen? Have they seen much interest? You have any sort of bites any takers you probably can't get too much into that but is there any interest yeah i mean that's uh i think the one gals over in europe right now the, the four river rocks over there work talking there's a there's all these festivals which i don't understand <laughs> all over the right world. yeah so, yeah some, some festival it's tv over in europe because i think it's paris i believe uh on that yeah. but the people we show um the i think the hardest point is it's not every episode doesn't have a reveal you know like uh say a home hgtv where at the end of the show, it's right. a house. And so it's kind yeah. of more of a lines where it builds on each other, but yet you can still come in at any episode and watch it and enjoy it. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, it's, it's, it's that. But I mean, we don't feel that we're not going to we'll have a problem. It's a matter of which network, and it could be a couple networks come together um, to do it. But I think with River Rock, I mean, that's that's what they do. That's their business and stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, so right. the project's twofold. I got my construction side, then you got the filming side, and, and then there's, I guess, the mesh where they come together and try to make it right so you're going forward regardless of television yeah this is yeah. your baby yeah i mean i've got to um so that's what we're talking yeah. time i said really we need to go this summer we already pushed it off from last summer and uh yeah. so we're gonna say okay let's push it off you know till this coming spring and hopefully we we go with it and uh right you know because you can't go back and film it after we've <laughs> got it no there's no, no. <laughs> and that's what, even with the way they're gonna film this show is kind of fun is that they are going to um it's a little more expensive because they want to do it where there's always cameras rolling, like six cameras on all the different characters. And it's like, if I fall off the scaffolding, it's funny the first time, but I'm not going to go redo it. And I can say, Hey, could you do that again? Yeah. So you got to catch it the first time. And anything just kind of happens. You, yeah. You're filming for a living. You know, there's certain things that you've got yeah. to run them when it happens. And there's a lot of dead film in between, but you know, you just want to make sure you capture that moment. Very cool. Well, this is really exciting. And uh, anything else you want the, the the listeners and the viewers to know about this project or anything you want to end with? We'll start putting stuff out. Uh, they got that Facebook page, uh, Mansion Impossible. And we'll start trying to yep. post stuff there. Same with uh, Instagram. I think it's called Mansion Impossible on Instagram. So if they can mm-hmm. follow that and let people know they're interested, um, you know, let the production companies know. And it's, it's just neat because even in this that little news articles, the number of people who are watching it and reading it, and we see the films that you guys do and the number of hits and the people we can show them, hey, people mm-hmm. see this stuff. You know, they, they, they yeah. see this project yeah. and they like it. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, just kind of follow us. And, uh, and I hope we can kind of keep communicating and, 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 and touch base with each other and let you know. And then we'll, we'll get you up there before, uh, before we do the, you know, the hammers. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll progress. Yeah. Because like I said, I think in my email today, I said, this is probably a rare project because you guys usually film stuff that's dead. And it's not coming. Yep. So, yep. you know, stay in life. <laughs> yeah i would be happy to take the trip up that way and uh and meet you and see the place one more time for so sure. let's definitely keep in touch will do and uh will do. thanks for being on the podcast and we'll definitely drop those links for the facebook page yeah. and the instagram account so everybody can follow along all right man appreciate it dave thank you Y'all take all right care. thank you very much i'll talk to you soon all right bye-bye so there you have it guys right from the horse's mouth himself I guess we can't call this the Peter Grant Mansion anymore. Now I guess we're going to have to call it the Chris Fisher Mansion or the Mansion Impossible Mansion. I don't know. I think it's always just going to be called the Peter Grant Mansion. Anyways, lots of awesome information from Chris. He really gave us the scoop and the lowdown on his plans, how this is all going to play out. And it sounds like next year, come summer, they're going to be full on cleaning up the property, getting it prepared, start filming, and we could have up to five to six seasons of Mansion Impossible to watch this thing all come together. And I personally can't wait. Guys, make sure you hit the links down below to follow Mansion Impossible on Instagram and on Facebook. I'll also drop my links to my two videos from 2020 and 2021 so that you guys can watch those and enjoy them. And uh, stay tuned here. Stay tuned on my social media and on the Mansion Impossible social media to keep up with all the latest news on this awesome, awesome project. Thanks a lot, Chris, for being here. Thanks to you guys for watching. Thanks for listening. And that's it. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.